Hello, everyone. This is Just a Dad, and you're listening to Coffee with Dad podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Just a Dad. I've got a very special guest on today, Mel Cardani Jr. Hi, Mel. Good morning. How you doing, Tom? Good. Good. How are you? So, your dad had a bakery in Wit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in Wit. I'm pretty sure you grew up in Wit too. In in the bakery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm, I want to hear all about that. But first. Your dad's bakery, very special memories I have with my dad going to the bakery and that going through the back door and seeing that oven on really hot. The, the, he had like an island where he would do the flour and the dough, I think. But just being, just going through that back door with your dad early in the morning and seeing Mel in there baking the donuts, just very, very special memories I have. And that, that's just, that's exactly why I wanted to have you on today. And I actually want to hear your story too, but. Tell me, what was your dad's bakery like? Well, early in the morning, as you said, before my mother would even get there to open the shop, most of the customers would come through the back door. I can't remember the one one gentleman's name. Uh, Heinz, I believe. He would be one of the first ones in. Ed Heinz. Is it? And he would go to the front of the bakery, say hi, go through. He'd go to the front. He would start the coffee. He would get out the Kramers and the sugars and put them on the table. Maybe a couple of other guys would come in and serve themselves. And then my mother might show up uh, to kind of take over and they would leave their money laying on the register and, and, uh, and leave. And that's, and then things just got really busy from, from that point on. But many people use the back door, came right through the shop. Yeah, um, there was always something to talk about, and you knew yeah. everybody's business and being oh, able to yeah. talk. So, yeah, yeah. So. Now, actually, I was thinking of, of the other day. I remember you and your dad being there, and you were about as tall as this counter oh, over yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, just it was just what a special thing to have in a small town. Um, and his his don he was known for his donuts, known for his wedding cake, but yeah, you know, what was it like growing up there? Well, I think. If I actually talked about the the hours and stuff, people today would say that was child abuse. Yeah. Uh, because we all, all of us kids, uh, and there were eight of us. Um, eight kids. Well, there's six, six from our family. Yeah. And then uh, Max and, and Emily. Yeah. And Emily never worked there that much, but um, lived live with us, uh, worked, Max worked there a lot. Um, but... We would start when you were 10 years old. Wow. It's happy birthday. You're 10 years old. Be there at 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, uh, wow. And the one of the first jobs we did, well, Friday night, uh, Friday night, I would go in at 10 o'clock at night. Oh, wow. And work until 3 o'clock in the morning. What for? Well, that's we worked all night on Friday night, and my dad would go into work around 7 o'clock and uh, start the baking. And because we had so much work, to, uh, so much product to get out on Saturday morning, oh. because my mother would never allow us to be open on Sunday. Okay. Um, so f- uh, the first job that I did was really packing dinner rolls. Packing and, dinner rolls. Yeah, just break them up and 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 a dozen pieces. And um, so Friday night, there was a lot of work going into Saturday's sales. A great deal. Okay. In fact, we made a great deal of Danish. For Saturday morning, because donuts don't keep very well, right. so people bought Danish on Saturday to have on, on Sunday, Sunday morning. Okay. So, uh, uh, but we we did have two bakeries probably before your time. Oh. On the west end of town. Really. I think your gra- uh, would have been your grandfather. Yeah. Had the, had the electrical shop. Yeah. Yeah. That was next door to. Yeah. My dad's bakery. Okay. That was the one that he bought or when he came to town after World War II. Okay. Which, by the way, <laughs> yeah. little, little known thing, my father, as far as we know, was the only baker in World War II, at least in the Navy, yeah. that was designated as essential personnel. Really? Now, this is, this is most of those people are going to be gone, so I don't have to yeah. worry too much yeah, about yeah. that. But on the ships during World War II, if there was a PT boat or a submarine, something that pulled up next to their ship, my dad yeah. was on a tanker, and they didn't have any guns. 
on a tanker because okay. that'd be like setting a, a lighter on top of a gas station. Yeah. You know, um, so they would pull up and whatever time of day or night, they would have to feed them. And my dad was the baker on the ship. And they went to transfer him and the captain said, no, <laughs> you can't take him. And whoever the powers were in, at yeah. that time said, how can you have a baker that is essential personnel? And the captain said, and I believe I even found this in some records. Captain said, I don't know how he does it. I'm not asking how he does it, but we never run out of bread. Wow. We never run out of bread or rolls. Well, my dad grew up in the Depression. He yeah. was, his father died when he was young, and all the kids went to work. And my dad went to work in a bakery in Staunton. Um, and at that time, he didn't throw anything away. People would bring in rancid butter. Well, they would trade that for for other things. And no that would go into maybe what they call sourdough bread or something. Yeah. But, but everything was used. So when they it came to being on the ship during the war, the flour and stuff would get buggy, would yeah. get mealworms in it or meal bugs. Yeah. And uh, most of the ships would throw it overboard. Oh. Well, my dad wouldn't throw it overboard, but people weren't going to eat it yeah. if it had bugs in it. So while he was at, in the islands, like in the Philippines, he would trade, because they traded everything, mm -hmm. for a bag of like caraway seed or rye. And if you've ever had uh, caraway seed or different spices, but if you've ever had rye bread, a dominant flavor in rye is caraway. Okay. So he would just take the caraway seeds, grind them up, put a little coloring in it and call it rye bread. And, you know. Well, you couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> you couldn't tell the difference and it went out anyway. And uh, that way they never had to throw flour overboard, but they had a tremendous amount of rye bread on the ship, which really wasn't rye bread at all. <laughs> rye bread without rye flour. So, <laughs> that's, a, that's an awesome story. But they were, you know, taught in survival training, yeah. eating is psychological. So, you know. It was probably very important that they were fed. Yeah. You know, you know, that helped. And nobody knew, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, what a neat story. Uh, anyway, where were we? Yeah. Um, yeah, just getting back to your, your dad's um, bakery, um, you know, do you remember what year it was he opened it up? Or Well, I believe it was like 1948. Oh, wow. And he and my Uncle Angelo uh, started the bakery there. And my grandmother, um, my dad's mother, uh, I believe, helped them. But they soon found out that two families could not survive, at least at that particular oh, wow. time. So my uncle Angelo moved on to do something else. I know that he worked for a bread company and stuff for a while. I don't really know what he was, yeah. what he did. I know later on he worked for a food service company. And then my dad uh, continued to run the bakery. And that was at a time when we first, being in the 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 first bakery that he had, we had the old, uh, what's called, uh, well, it was a coal-fired oven. Oh, wow. And uh, a big, massive thing. The found, foundation for it, I'm, I'm sure, is still. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. It's part of the it, building, probably. <laughs> it's part of, yeah. It's still there. And it was converted over to gas. And I was still pretty little at the time. But when the fire would kick on, before it would kick on, it would build up gas in the uh, oven and then the fire would kick on well we, we baked on cornmeal and you bake things in a rotation because the oven was very hot at first the bread went in first and the bread went in on cornmeal and then after the bread came out then the pies or something might go in and you just rotated down but when that oven would kick on it would blow the doors open and it was like being sandblasted if you were any close <laughs> anywhere close to the door and all the cracks in the walls were packed full of of uh, cornmeal. Oh, that's so, funny. But that was really, that was the original bakery that was okay. there. And when they bought it, everything that was in the place was just piled up in the middle of the room. Oh, wow. Um, but I still remember even being very young, sitting at the counter, and my dad would mix up sugar and egg whites, and we would press them as little kids, we would press them into these molds yeah. and then stand them up and make bells because all wedding cakes had bells on them. Oh, wow. So, and my dad would started doing a lot of cakes then. He was actually one of the original students for Wilton uh, when okay. John Wilton was doing the teaching. I don't um, know who that is. He, Wilton 
company. I'm sure that uh, you've probably seen their product. Yeah. Cake decorating stuff all over okay. the country is Wilton. Okay. Well, that was started by John Wilton, who started after World War II teaching cake decorating. And no kidding. That's my dad went to Chicago, slept in the back of a van, which you wouldn't do today in Chicago. No, no, no. no. <laughs> slept in the back of the van and um, attended, learned how to decorate cakes. And the style changed a lot I, now that I know the things that I know. Um, there used to be a lot of fine piping, a lot of little delicate work, and it takes forever. Yeah. Um, he modified that a great deal okay. and went down to kind of his style and... Uh, we did do a lot of cakes. Yeah. You know, for a town of, what, 1,100? Yeah. Uh, there were weeks that we would do 14 or 15 wedding cakes. Oh, wow. And uh, those were big ticket items. You couldn't survive on just selling donuts, donuts or whatever. And coffee. And, and at first place, we didn't even have coffee. The second place, that when they, uh, when my dad built yeah. the one that everybody remembers, yes. uh, that's when the coffee counter was put in. Oh. And uh, that became... Quite the gathering spot. Oh, I know. And what was coffee back then, probably? A nickel? Oh, I don't know. It may oh. have been a quarter. Oh, I don't, a quarter, I don't. yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the money was just laying on the register. Yeah, and, so yeah. <laughs> it was like, uh, I do remember bread was like, bread from the bakery was like 21 cents a loaf. Wow. And today, I think if you're buying bread at a bakery, I don't know what it is. Some of them, I know some of the artisan breads are 4 or $5 oh, a loaf. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And they make it out of a sour, which... You know, we used to make a sourdough bread, but you, you took too much time and yeah. you didn't have the market. And, and as the baking industry progressed, um, yeah. anytime a machine can do a job, yeah, it's pretty much done for. Yeah. So making bread is all machine made now. Yeah. Um, I still bake bread at home. My dad continued after he retired, continued to make bread like for the family. Yeah. We would go and pick up bread at and he liked doing that. And today I kind of do the same thing because I still have some of his smaller equipment. When he retired, he put a bakery in his garage oh, where, no where he would play and uh, or keep him out of mother's hair. <laughs> and uh, I, when he got too old to even do that, then he gave me the equipment. Oh, and, how uh, special. I put it when we built our house where some guys have a mechanic shop yeah. or a wood shop yeah, yeah. or your father-in-law, I'm sure probably had a electric shop. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so, well, um, I have a bakery. I, I, no I kidding. Do baking and stuff. So that's awesome. I do remember he had a big mixer. And those are relatively small mixers compared oh, to wow. today. I mean, people come into my house and see this 20 quart mixer, which is, uh, you know, if you're, you know, probably three feet tall, and it right. sits. It sits on a uh, a, a, yeah, a stand. stand. Yeah. And now that was what that was the little mixer in our shop, and they go by the size. So those were five quart. The uh, the ones you have at home on your counter are yeah. five quart. Okay. And the one that I have is a twenty, 20 quart. Twenty quart. But we used eighty quart mixers. Were those two mixers that sit on the floor? Okay. And today the the mixers are similar to that. Are eighty quarts would be small. Yeah. Um. 120 quart, uh, but right. you know that's. And I remember the he had a bunch of racks in the back. There was, it, yeah, lots of racks on rollers, wasn't there? Yeah, 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 yeah. One of them was a, we called it a suicide rack <laughs> because if you didn't watch it, it would tip over. <laughs> that was that would have been a really oh. nasty. Because his happen. donuts to this day, I consider the standard. Like his his donuts tasted just so good, and like you, once in a while you'll find a place. Oh yeah, this tastes really good. You know, his donuts were not, would not meet the expectations that people have for donuts today. When he made a donut, it weighed probably two and a half, three ounces. And it was solid yeah. and, and big and chewy. Those cost a lot of money to make. So the industry uh, today, the more air you can pump into a donut, yep. the more light, the lighter that you can get a donut... They're they're down to about an ounce and a quarter. Oh wow! Uh, is what a donut is now, <laughs> and uh, it's 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 a lot of air, and that's what has set people believe is a good donut. You grew up on yes. the other hand with like my dad's, oh, man. which were very solid and moist, and and yeah, fresh. And, and well, <laughs> 
for you guys, to me, I'm kind of spoiled. I, I, I still make donuts once in a while yeah. when my grandkids are there. After about four hours, I don't touch them. Yeah. Oh, oh that. <laughs> so, so it's like now cake donuts are different. I can go with a cake donut for a day. Or, right, right. Uh, keep it a you day. You had them ultimate fresh. Yeah. Um, generally, as we progressed in age, started out wrapping dinner rolls and then uh, moved on to slicing bread, which today you're not even allowed to run the machinery. Oh, um, wow. you know, dangerous. If you were, yeah, it's too dangerous. But, you know, once again, it's kind of like farm kids. You wouldn't allow farm kids to drive tractors or whatever it, right today and of course oh yeah back then, i'm sure my dad was on the tractor at eight years older he was because i knew your dad would he i used to spend time on your grandfather's farm okay uh, there was a friendship between your your grandfather and and mother, grandmother and my mom and dad oh, yeah, and i, did, I would yeah. go out there and milk cows uh, oh and we did it by hand yes on, on the stool no and, kidding and then once the milking was done uh your dad and his sister yeah. Um, and Janet. Uh, huh? And yeah. Janet. Yeah. They would get into a, uh, like a water fight and there was water <laughs> going, buckets of water flying and stuff. <laughs> so, but Aww. I did, I learned how to milk a cow. Um, yeah. On a low stool and how to crowd in and, yeah. you know, <laughs> turn your head, put it up against the cow. <laughs> you know? And your dad had a little, your grandfather had a little Ford tractor that yeah. he used to let me drive. No kidding. Yeah. yeah, it was one of those. You still see them around today. It's one of my favorite little tractors. Oh. It was a little Ford tractor, and I loved driving that. I do remember that special relationship my grandma and grandpa had with your your mom and dad. Yeah, they, was, uh, we would go visit them. I'd be over at grandma and grandpa's, and he'd be like, "Let's go see Mel," or you know, it's just pretty neat. Well, there wasn't much of any place to go in town. Well, like true. I said, there were three doors of the bakery. It is uh, one door was uh, to the side of the the front entrance. Yeah. Um, that's where maybe the employees came in from parking out outside okay. and then the back door, which yeah. is where a lot of people uh, came in anytime. It, it was just something you did. I remember Friday nights were, were big nights. Uh, I didn't mind Friday night because we would go to work at 10 o'clock, but a lot of the people that worked in the factories, uh, would come in, um, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 no o'clock. Kidding. When the bars closed, they would stop oh, over yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and get it. So you knew everything that was going on from everybody in town. Yeah. Um, and they would stand around and talk. Uh, uh, the Sarsney boys, it was Jay and Polly. Yeah. Um, and then Andy was in during the day uh, once in a while. He and my dad did some bartering. Okay. You know, and well, he was like antique dealer, wasn't he, or something? Uh, no, I don't know. Andy, but, I don't know if he got into that or not. Okay, okay. But uh, he was superintendent of the schools. Yes. And the man was so dedicated oh, to the school. Just right. he dedicated his he, life. He kept that place going. And yeah. um, well, both of them are gone, so they aren't going to put him in jail. But the commodities would come into the school. And the school had no use for 30 pounds of peanut, or, or six cans of 30 pounds of peanut butter. Or um, twenty bags of fifty-pound flour. They didn't do any baking. Yeah. So, so Mr. Sarsney would trade it with my father for yeah. bread, and my dad always. They didn't buy commercial bread. My, they always bought the bread from the bakery, and my dad would use that flour and, and make a lot of the bread for for the school. So together they oh, they, that's they pretty a, that's much worked, worked up a, a deal that was to the benefit of everybody without. Yeah. The official involvement. It right. says, I used to always wonder. It says not for barter, not for trade, yeah. not for sale. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but somehow it, it it did, and it worked. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to yeah. everybody's benefit. You're right. So, growing up in a bakery, did that make you want to be a baker? I, I'm not sure that I wanted to be a baker. I was always comfortable with the idea. I didn't go to school uh, to be a baker. Um, didn't really, I wasn't really fond of the hours. Right, yeah. Um, so out of school, I went to work in a factory, which paid really well. Oh, okay. And uh, from there, I went into food service sales, and I was working actually at a, a supermarket bakery. Supermarket bakeries were just getting started, where they would buy oh, frozen yeah. bread and frozen rolls and stuff like that. And I was actually working here, I believe, in... At the IGA store, okay, just once in a while, I was decorating cakes for them oh. or something, and a, a salesman came in and, how do you know how to do all this stuff? And I told him, 
And about a week later, he came back and said, how would you like to go to work for us? So I went to work for a com manufacturing company in Chicago. Okay. And we manufactured mixes. And I, I was a, called a technician, and they would send me out with, I was the only thing in the company that wasn't in a bucket or a bag. And <laughs> they would send me out to teach baking in newly opened stores. So a supermarket would open, and they would put a bakery in, and then they would buy the mixes, but somebody had to train the people. Okay. And we would have one to two weeks to train somebody how to run a wow. bakery. And uh, that I traveled around the country uh, a lot, yeah, mostly, during, mostly during the Midwest. And then I changed companies and went to work for another bakery company in a better position. And then I did a lot of extensive traveling. I could be, I could take two to four flights a week someplace. Oh, wow. I might be in South Carolina for breakfast. I do remember this. One day I was in South Carolina for breakfast, and by evening I was in Los Angeles um, no for way. dinner. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and stopped in Chicago in between. And then I ended up um, doing some international work. Oh, wow. I worked in Korea. And, no kidding. Yeah, and, uh, and Japan and Greece. Worked with some of the really renowned great bakers. Okay. Um, and learned a lot of stuff along the way. Right. Uh, things that my, my dad just worked hard and did things the way it was done yes. from the Depression on. Yes. Um, and maybe he did or did not know why certain things were done. Right. Why you put ammonia carbonate in... <laughs> cream puffs or whatever. No kidding. But but that's well. Actually, he did know that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, I learned more of the chemistry as it went along, and finally got into. Before I um, retired, I was in research and development no and uh, quality control. But you know, that's that's, that's me. That's not my dad. My dad right. was just a a hardworking man. Everybody oh, yeah. in the family worked. Um, it was wonderful training. I mean, if you're going to be a farmer, you don't just decide no. to graduate high school and go out and, and start farming. I mean, right, that right. doesn't work. It's something that you, you pretty much taught. grow up with. And you can go to college and learn a lot of, a great deal about agriculture. Right. Um, I am teaching in college No now. kidding, right now. Yeah. Uh, a couple nights a week, um, pastry, what? pastry arts. No kidding. Yeah. And um, there's two ways to look at it. They have a, Big, huge book that's probably, well, three inches thick. I don't know how many pages. Full of formulas. And bakers call their recipes formulas because oh. the re cooks have a recipe, and that's an art. Bakers have a formula because that's a science. Certain things, oh. if you, you can make a lot of mistakes cooking and keep and cover it up. You make a mistake in baking, and it's, it, it's pretty much done. <laughs> but anyway, the um, course I teach, I have been behind the eight ball the entire time because I started like I, I had like a week's notice and uh, to, to get up and running. And this course covers 12 chapters and wow. the science that is in there. Um, and uh, they pride themselves on a lot of French terms. Um, right. And if you're going to be in a profession, you better know the language of that prof profession. So, um, I struggle with that myself, trying to teach the students uh, that. But I, I more or less work on the bench with them and put things together, and then they do it. Then I'll come back and do something, and then. So they they're actually it. baking in the class. Oh yeah, Lincolnland has a wonderful setup. No kidding. For culinary arts, oh they have. I had a, no idea. Oh gosh, the culinary arts program at Lincolnland has a bistro out in front, very modern, stylish cafe that is open to the public. A couple couple of days a week and um then they have the culinary arts school which is behind the glass and they have a huge kitchen in the back and a lot of students enrolled so if you go into the bistro and order lunch i had lunch there the other day with uh lobster and shrimp nooks um with nooks and uh lobster sauce yeah. with, with shrimp and coffee and it was like 15 dollars. which this was is probably, in springfield yes Oh, yeah. at the campus. Yep, right on the campus. Oh, we're going to go eat there. And they have a community program, um, which 
they run like, I think it's on Friday nights, maybe once a month, where they will have a formal dinner. And you pay by the person. That yeah. one's not cheap, but it comes with all of your drinks uh, with each course. They do a wonderful job. And part of the other part of that, which is back a step further, is the bakery. And they have what would be considered for where I came from uh, in Chicago, a lab. Uh, but okay. there's enough space with induction burners and, and ovens and small mixers. And most of their work is done with a little uh, five-quart mixer, but they have 20 and 60-quart mixers okay. and sh some sheeters and stuff to... Uh, okay. So are you, is there a big demand for this class? My class was full. Um, really? I, like I said, this is my first time around, and it was very, very difficult. Three... Uh, Three weeks into it, and I was ready to throw in the towel oh, because no, I just could not catch up on everything. I couldn't catch up on the reading. I couldn't. I had to do the lesson plans. I had to do the ordering. Uh, it was oh, very, wow. very hectic, and I put a tremendous amount of time. There's only like four or five more classes left, yeah. and now I'm starting to feel comfortable. So uh. if if the opportunity comes up, I'll probably go back and do it a second time around. But all of this stuff. The foundation I learned from my father. Oh, yeah. And a lot of it was repetition. I try to teach these students how to make a dinner roll and, you know, to use both hands and roll a roll with both hands. And they struggle with that, um, okay. the coordination. But here I'm 12 years old or 13 years old and yeah. at the counter and I'm getting yelled at by my dad because I'm not doing it fast enough <sighs> and I'm already out running the other bakers, but that was a, right, right, <laughs> that was right. a different story. Well, you didn't have video <laughs> games back then. <laughs> no, we <laughs> had no such thing as video games. Oh, so. that is such that those students have probably what a perspective, a father who owned a bakery, somebody who worked all over, traveled all over for the baking industry. I mean, I'm sure you're bringing some really good information to them. There's not a lot I haven't seen. You yeah, know, uh, I'm not proficient at everything, but given a given time, I I pre pretty much can yeah tackle most of the general stuff. So how was traveling back then? You said you could fly all the time. Was it easier? Just it was much easier. I um, quit at, at the week before 9/11. Oh wow! Uh, the month before 9/11. Um, travel at that time was starting to be difficult, but I flew so much and I went through several airlines, started out flying with Braniff oh, yeah. and then with Eastern yeah. and uh, then with TWA, but the airlines were, were dying off. Um, yeah. However, because I flew so much, I always had the, the gold cards and just walk up to the counter and into a private lounge and, and private entry and uh, first First on the plane and first right. class service. So traveling was that made it easier, but it, it was, was much easier. But still hard on your probably your body. I was young. I didn't oh, okay. I didn't notice that. Okay. At first it was um the excitement of jetting around the country. Oh yeah. And after a while it it became a pain to <laughs> to drive to the airport and park and and right. schlep all your luggage in and yeah. uh, so it was nice that they made it better at that time. Right. Today, even going on vacation, it, I would it is tough. take a beating. I would rather drive yep. 500 miles than get on a plane and fly yeah, yeah. any place. Yeah. So. What's some interesting stories from Korea? I, <laughs> funny you should ask that. Um, when I did work like in Korea or Japan, it was through the U.S. Embassy. No kidding. And our embassies, what I found out at that time, are the salesmen of our agriculture products. Okay. So actually what we see as diplomats and stuff, behind the scene, there is a great deal of... Um, buy our corn, buy our flour. Ex exactly. And and I was there because we, we did agriculture products. Um I had two translators with me, and a funny thing was at a reception, I'm trying to think if this was in Japan or Korea, um, it was in Korea, um, the reception, the, the charge d'affaires or whatever, at that time, 
was from Vandalia, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what a small world and, and right. he remembered playing us in basketball oh so, no kidding yeah. um, and then we had the dinner and one of my interpreters got a little intoxicated so I had still the other interpreter to take her <laughs> home <laughs> so, so it was getting a little embarrassing right um, right um, how long and, would you spend over there I was in Korea I think just a couple of weeks okay um, and the funny thing is, as I'm teaching this class at Lincoln Land, um, and we need to get back to my our, our bakery and wit. Oh no, no. this is about your bakery and wit. <laughs> uh, but and as, you. as I'm teaching this class, um, the the people that are professionally trained um, have very high standards. Right. Um, the the chefs in the building, um, and. They they can be, for example, uh, pastry cream. I, I'm taking that today as a, an example. The French way of making it is a three page recipe. Wow. Um, the American way to do it is written on the back of a recipe card. You know, yeah. you can well you can learn this three pages and all the French terms and everything that goes into the the liaison and the um, right. <laughs> Chantilly, you know, Chantilly, that's whipped cream. But, but, <laughs> but uh, What tastes better? Does the three-page taste better? No, it tastes the exact. The end product is the same. I'm no kidding. And, and it's, it's, it's because I learned we would cook filling on a stove. We would get fruit that would come in frozen in a, a big gold can, like a five-gallon can. Yeah, yeah. Pop, pop the lid off of that, set the entire can on the stove, and when, once it was thawed, and you cook it, yeah. and then you mix up a little starch and water and, and poured it in with a spoon, or we had a um, a boiler, uh, steam boiler, yeah. that had a copper pipe on it. And if you turned on the steam from that copper pipe and you stick it into the... <laughs> stir, you know, so that's the way we did things. But today it takes three pages of directions wow. to to explain how to do what yeah. a sixteen year old was doing. You know. Were you doing all those steps and now they're just written out? Or they they explain everything as they're going along. Okay. And and I don't know. If you've looked at recipes, I've I've seen this. If you've looked at recipes on the web um for anything, mm-hmm. such as a pate chou, which is a cream puff. And there's your French term, pate chou. <laughs> um it they will start out, there's almost a life story before they ever get to the formula. No kidding. Um, and the formula itself is really pretty simple. Okay. But a lot of times they explain every step and they give every step a name. And <laughs> I just do the end step. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is a cream puff. You know, that's, yeah, 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 <laughs> that's yeah, what yeah. it's going to be. Uh, what was probably the biggest bakery you saw on your travels or... Oh my gosh! I, as far as bakeries, of course, I've worked in some um, uh, large factory productions because we would make product that would be utilized by the bakery industry. Wonderful! I would say probably one of the most impressive bakeries was in Philadelphia. Really? And um, I'm not exactly sure. It was some kind of bakers organization. This bakery, a retail bakery was huge and very, very popular. And obviously the guy did very well. In fact, he owned a movie theater next door. <laughs> so we were there and then uh, for some kind of meeting and then he had a big uh, dinner reception at the movie theater that the bakery owned. And the movie was about a baker. <laughs> I think Tony Danza. And oh, uh, I don't funny. remember what it was about, but... Uh, it was a beautiful, wonderful bakery that had tons of variety, but you've got tons of people to to purchase that, unlike Wit. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't sell a $4 cream puff in Wit. No. No. No, no. <laughs> or in Montgomery County. No, no. Uh, it's, you got to make the product for right. the market. And we were probably donuts in Danish. And yeah. Did you ever run across a bakery that was similar to your dad's in your travels? Oh, Lots, lots really? of them. Okay. Generally, I don't have to um, 
I don't know if they would have the personality. I, I assume all of them have a personality, but ours was a, a community um, location. Yes. So you had the people in the front of the store. You had the people in the back. You had my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, who no um, had her set of customers that came in when she was working. My mother had her customers in the morning. Uh, my dad had his friends that would come in the back. So there was always a rotation of um, people and personalities. <laughs> and uh, I, I've had bakers. Uh, the Mon Olive Bakery is a wonderful bakery. Okay. And, and it's a small shop. And he still does everything by hand. He does wonderful stuff. But once again, it's not your French um, right, right. Gourmet type place. It's it's what we are used to around here. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, you're starting to see a lot more of these grocery store bakeries. Those are doing very well. Well, I've watched the transition on those over the years. Okay. Um, it's funny. Early early on with Walmart, uh, when Walmart started putting in groceries. Yeah. Um, I was friends with the person who became the director, and uh, she was putting in these huge. Donut operations, similar yep. to what you would see at a Krispy Kreme, um, the, the early Krispy Kremes uh, that was, were out there. And it was totally automated um, from beginning to end. They're very expensive, and they, they, have, they produce a lot of product. Yes. Well, there was one in our local Walmart, for example, for a very short time because you've got this big piece of machine, and it does humongous production but it 15, 15 minutes into operating it, and it's produced everything that Litchfield's going to buy in a day. Oh, so uh, yeah, you, you saw those machines in all the new Walmarts, and then the boarded walls went up, and no more uh, of that. In fact, where products started out in the in-store bakery being frozen, and then you would just proof it and bake it off, oh. then it went to kind of mixes to where they were trying to, to make their own bread and uh, proof it you, you can't find skilled labor there was tremendous turnover so it's now gone back to most of the stuff even comes in baked and it's no kidding. maybe rolled into the oven to warm it up or or thaw oh, it wow. out um donuts for example uh come in pre-fried and uh, frozen and they would put them in the oven or the proof box just to warm them up or or puff the wrinkles out of them and then they would glaze, Ice, glaze, glaze them, them. And, and, yeah. and they were called ESL extended life donuts which there was a great deal of chemistry that goes into the baking oh. so so they had enzyme in it that would keep the starch from solidifying and and oh. make the donuts last sometimes for two days oh. <laughs> not really not really my thing <laughs> so yeah what's um how would your dad's donuts compare, or even donuts you make, to Krispy Kreme? Oh, nothing, nothing like it. You know, Krispy Kreme donuts is great if you're standing there in line and and if they're they're yeah. handing them to you. I can eat a whole dozen. Uh, yeah, when they're because Why? they're all air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a little one ounce, probably one ounce, one ounce and a quarter donut or or smaller, and um, they're made from a very soft dough, uh, uh, high hydration, and you know, they're they're fine as long as they're very very, very fresh, fresh yeah or even warm right out of the fryer but cardboard is good when it's warm right out of the fryer <laughs> uh, dads were were more like a a, a bread yeah they, yeah they were solid and, yeah and, and heavy and uh, you know they weren't even made from a mix it was a pretty simple um lard you know, <laughs> we used ingredients. All the formulas that my dad had came out of the Depression era. So my dad didn't use butter hardly at all. There was hardly any butter ever used or milk for that matter. Everything was lard and uh, water. Okay. And of course, we had fresh eggs that people would bring in from the farm. You can't do that anymore. They all yeah. have to be candled and grated and, and uh and wow. Dad used to, many, many years ago, um, the town was filled with a bunch of um, immigrants mm -hmm. and wonderful, diverse culture. I mean, Yugoslavians and, and 
English, and of course, everybody had the ethnic names, which are called derogatory now, but at that time, they were terms of endearment. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, uh, yeah. people didn't, didn't use them as an insult. It right. Was, and there were a lot of the people, especially the Hungarians and the Yugoslavian people, that would bring in, like, berries. They would go out and pick blackberries. Really? And they might pick a gallon or, or two gallons. Right. And then they would bring it into the bakery, and my dad would give them credit, and he would use it to make filling, and then they would trade their credit uh, for for bread because most of them didn't buy a lot of pastries, but they bought a lot of bread. bread. And, uh, you know, once again, it's it's funny to see when I was in Europe or in um, Asia, which is where the school puts a lot of influence on. The Europeans do it the best. Um, it's it's better. It's uh, But yet you go over there and they're wanting to do it our way. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, how do you do this? How do you do that? Because it's too much work the way they're doing it. And they have the problems that we have, yeah. getting help, getting yeah. uh, the labor. What was probably the number one selling thing at your dad's bakery? I would say it's going to be the donuts. The donuts, really? Yeah, donuts and, yeah, pastry, cookies and things were would, would sell. Um, but never paid too much attention to them. Yeah. Brownies, there was always a pan of brownies in the... Uh, oh, that's right. He had those green trays. Yep. <laughs> he had the display. He, they would always slide them in, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the green trays. Uh, Danish on Saturday, donuts throughout the week. And it used to be, many years ago, bread was a big seller. But as commercial breads came along for 10 yeah. cents a loaf or whatever, um, the sale of breads... He just couldn't compete with that. No, but there were still people. There were always people that, that bought bought that because you bought your bread at the bakery yeah. and there were people that went shopping every day and uh yeah today they go get their stock up for the week yeah and uh you know stop at the bakery every day or every other day and then of course there was like the hospitals and stuff they would have somebody stop in pick up a box of donuts to deliver to the hospital yeah the elevator uh always had donuts um, oh yeah yeah the grain elevator yeah so yeah that's right they did yeah yep yeah. and uh a matter of fact, my dad was a very charitable man. Um, was one day, I had this a suede coat, yeah. um, jacket, a bomber jacket, and I really liked that coat. And uh, I was at school one day, and a kid had on my coat, <laughs> and I didn't say anything. And I went back and I, I told my dad, I said, "Hey, so and so's got my coat. How did he get my coat?" And my dad said. You just shut your mouth on that. Um, uh, he doesn't have anything. You got more coats than you than you need, uh, and don't you say anything to him about it. Yeah, you know. So, uh, uh, so and and there would be many years ago, and there was a family. The boys later became pretty good bakers. Um, they lived in a house, and it was what today would be called a dysfunctional family. Yeah. So at two o'clock in the morning, the kids might be out and they're cold and there's no heat in the house. And you might find them sleeping behind the oven in the bed. My dad would take flour wow. sacks and put them on the floor and feed them and stick them behind the oven to where they could sleep and stay warm. Oh, wow. uh, you know, people never saw right. some of those things no. like that. So I remember your, your, your dad's best donut I ever had was it had the, the cream in it, the white cream. He would, would inject it in uh -huh. it, and I think it would be a little bit on the top in the center. What was that called? Well, today I think they call them kettle tarts, but at that, that, that time it may have just been what they called honeymooners. Yeah. Um, just another jelly yeah. donut or a way yeah. of, uh, of It was filled with the, the white cream and it had the chocolate glaze on it. Oh, man, it was just so good. Yeah. I don't remember some of those because well, it's been so oh. so long, but... And the donuts probably changed over time, didn't they? They have. Um, what, what he sold at the beginning compared to what he was selling towards the end, do you think, changed? I think he he was pretty constant. Pretty constant. Uh, his entire life, not not much changed. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, um, it was pretty, pretty steady. I mean, once in a great while, he might come up with something new. Um, yeah. Shared from another baker. For example, um, here, here, here you go. Uh, if you remember years ago, there there was a a fad called a 
Crow Donut. Um, came out of New York. It was on Good Morning America where this guy had perfected this donut, which was like a croissant. Yeah. But it was actually a donut, and this was the big thing. Okay. Uh, my dad and the and John Ubelt were making those donuts Oh, no many, kidding. many years ago. They were called Donetsos. <laughs> Maybe shaped a little different, but the stuff was the same. That's like I said, but it, they got the um, the publicity from it. Uh, and, you know, there was a big cupcake fad. Um, oh, yeah. I years remember ago. that, yeah. That started from one 40-second spot on a TV show. Um, TV show about a bunch of women in New York. I think it was called Sex in the City or whatever. Yeah. And the one lady was sitting out in front of a bakery in New York eating a cupcake. Okay. And, you know, that from that 45-second mm -hmm. spot of her chowing down on a very messy cupcake, right? whatever, uh, that scene kicked off the entire uh, oh, wow. cupcake craze. Yeah. There, and that's just a don't. That's just a cake, right? Just it's just yeah. It's yeah. just a cake. Now you know, I my daughter wanted cupcakes. Thank God um, yeah. for for her wedding because for my other two children, I made my son. I made a, a monstrosity of a cake. Oh wow! And um, I used a lot of the old English piping, uh, and I kept trying to get my daughter in law tell me what she wanted. And she said, you just make something. You just make something. And one day I said, what color lights do you want on your cake? And she said, you're not going to Italianize my wedding cake. <laughs> I said, yeah, tell me what color lights you want on it. And she said, don't put lights on my wedding cake. Uh, well, it was a, a joke because in between the layers, I filled it with I think I probably had a thousand roses, tiny roses on this cake. And I filled between the layers that were separated. And then I had fiber optics uh, lights oh. that, that I put in between all of the, the flowers. So when it we, she got to the <laughs> wedding and this cake was on the table and I turned it on, she, you did put lights on my <laughs> cake, but it was, it looked very nice and tasteful. But my daughter, the youngest daughter, she wanted cupcakes. And she wanted no decorations on her uh. wedding cake whatsoever. In fact, she didn't even want the icing smooth. Um, wow. And as the father of the bride, I got up there and this wedding cake was sitting there. And I said, I'm sure that many of you came to see what kind of spectacular wedding cake there is. And yeah. this is just the most simple right. as simple can get. However, the cooler was filled with a thousand cupcakes oh, of wow. every variety that you could think of. And I used Kahlua and chocolate and oh. brand, I used brandy and uh, all of them had some type of alcohol um, infusion into it or, or saturation. And all of them were filled with some kind of filling. So it was quite, quite the extravaganza yeah. for cupcakes. But <laughs> that was, Yeah. Well, Mel, it's just been a real pleasure having you on today. And, and you know, thank you for teaching. You know, that, that's a hard profession to do. And, and thank you for what you've done. And and um, just really thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it, Tom. It's yeah. nice, nice to have good news. Yeah, yeah. Remember as a kid, you don't remember, there used to be a newspaper called Grit. Mm -mm. And they only printed good news and they sold it door to door for like a quarter or whatever. Okay. And it was just nothing but good news. And, you know, it's kind of nice to have yeah. something like this, which is just yeah. good news. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're, I, uh, I didn't tell you a lot of stories. I well, yeah, but there yeah. are a couple I could have put yeah. out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your dad's bakery, I'm sure, has a special place in a lot of people's hearts. So. so. And if they want that formula for the cookies, you know, if you hear about it, yeah. Uh, I'll give it to you, Tom, and okay. you can put it out there. All right. So. Well, thank you, Mel, for coming on today. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm.